I would like for you to open up your Bibles to John 4. And we're going to kind of stay there a little bit. We'll bounce around a little bit, but I really want you to end there. And I want you to open it up. To, it's on page 1635 of your pew Bible. And there's reason here because I'm going to talk about worshiping in spirit and truth. How do we worship in spirit and truth? Remember, what, what is our theme for this year? Come on, I keep saying it every year, every, every Sunday now. Seeking the truth and speaking the truth. Because I believe we need to do that. I'm looking at also on things that we really need to do. Now, a thing came to me, and I almost changed my sermon this morning over it. I was in my prayers, I was thinking, and a question came to me. What is the difference between revival and an awakening? And so we're going to discuss the truth about that coming up next week, about what is the difference? Do you need to be revived, or do you just need a bunch of cold water thrown in your face to wake up? That's going to depend on where you're walking and how you're walking. But today, we're going to be talking about worshiping in truth. So if you open up your Bibles, and in verse 23, but before we get there, anybody know what this part is? This is an interesting part because this is the first place that Jesus teaches about prayer. And he's doing it to a Samaritan, not a Jewish, not to the Jewish crowd, not to his disciples. He did it to a woman that didn't want to give him water. Anybody know who I'm talking about? The woman at the well, the one that had been married two or three times. Can you imagine independent Christian churches today? They'd be judging them like crazy. But yet Jesus came to her and started talking to her. So let's bow our heads a minute. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, as we open up your word, enlighten the words to us, Lord. Make it clear to what we need to understand. We thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And... I'm going to kind of do a little bit backwards. I'm going to start lower, then I'm going to come back up and kind of build what it is to worship and pray in the spirit and in truth. So let's look at what he says in verse 23. But the hour is coming, which means what? Something in the future. And now is, so in the future and today, when he was speaking, when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Keep that in mind. So there's going to be a day that the true worshiper is going to do it what? In, in truth and in spirit. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So this is not a something that you can decide that you want to or not to. What did he say? A true worshiper What? Must. What does must mean? Is that an option? Is that if I feel like it? No. That is something that has to be done. It has to be. These words that Jesus spoke to that Samaritan woman, as we know, it's the first recording. Let me correct that. It's the first recording teaching on the subject of prayer. Now, to me, that's interesting because we know that the, 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 the Israelites, the priests, the shepherds were the first to see Jesus. Remember when they, Jesus was a baby? Jesus was teaching in the synagogue to the Pharisees and the Sadducees when he was 12. He started talking to his ministries. He actually even went to Nazareth and said that these scriptures, when he read out of Isaiah 61, that in Luke, what is that, Luke 4? 416, that, hey, the scriptures are fulfilled today. But yet, here is the first time that he's going to talk to you about the subject of prayer. And prayer is something that we lack in America churches today. We used to have prayers on Friday night, Friday night prayers. We used to talk about prayer and spend time in prayer. I remember one time at Manor Church, we had a 24-hour period of prayer and we had my boys were little and they were sleeping in the chairs. 
and the people sitting there praying 24 hours. We got to get a hunger for prayer. It is not just something that we do when we feel like it or when you hit a hammer on your nails. Most people start using their old selves, right? Come on. But we need to get into this prayer. So he talks about it, and he talks about this wonderful glimpse into the world of prayer that we need to find. What what did we just read? The Father seeks worshipers. You see, when you're praying in truth, you are worshiping God. You need to understand that that is worship. And when we're praying up here, it is worship. And, you know, something that we don't do, which I used to like the old churches and some of the other denominations do it, and I think it's a cool thing. And I, I, I caught this on, on television the other day, and I hadn't heard it in a long time. The old man stands up, looks at the congregation with a very deep voice. He goes, will you please stand in reading of the word of God? And it dawned on me. Why would he say that? How do you worship? By getting into God's word. But are you reverencing God's word? Do you stand and honor God's word? Or are we just, it's just something in in an old book. But the father seeks worshipers. Our worship satisfies his loving heart. It brings joy to him. He's seeking true worshipers to find that there's nothing else. If he wants to touch your life, you must worship him in truth. Not just because he's the ATM in heaven. Many times we think he's just an ATM in heaven. You know, we don't pray to him until we what? We run out of our resources. Then we start praying. And then we don't even listen sometimes. You know, how many times have you been driving across? You, now it's not so bad, but I remember back in the 70s and 80s, driving across the mountains of Kentucky. What is something that you had to make sure you had before you started across that mountain? Gas. And I remember driving and felt in my heart, I said, I need to get gas. I, nah, I got plenty. Wasn't listening to what the Spirit was telling me inside of me. Got halfway through the mountain. My car quit running. Guess what I first thing I did? Well, Lord, help me. Lord, bring somebody in here. Lord, bring somebody to give me some gas. See, I was doing it. I was warned ahead of time. And don't we do that a lot? We don't go to the Lord in prayer until we've reached our end. See, that's not worshiping. That's begging. Nothing wrong to ask God to help you. But you need to get it in front instead of at the rear. We need to truly feel that God gets pleasure. Can you imagine the God of the universe gets pleasure? In our worship. So as we were singing today. How many of you are grumbling about. Oh that's just the old hymns. How many of you were actually worshiping with. Do you, did you hear the words? Did you even think about what the words were saying? Now were you saying that in the flesh? Or were you saying that in the spirit? We need to truly worship God in all aspects. True worshipers is that which in spirit and in truth. If you're sitting there raising your voice, praising God, but you're grumbling on the inside, are you worshiping in the spirit? I had a man ask me a question yesterday about a situation. 
And he said, I prayed. But then he felt like the Holy Spirit told me to pray again. And I asked him, I said, so, and it was about forgiveness. And I asked him, I says, did you forgive already? Or do you still have that resentment, but you prayed anyway? And I use an example of sitting down in a chair. You know, the boss says, sit down. Or you tell your children, sit down. And they go and they... (laughs) Okay? They're obeying, but are they doing it in the correct spirit? So when we worship, are we worshiping in the human form, but yet in our hearts, we got resentment for people We got anger for people. We got disrespect for people. Or are we surrendering it all to God and saying, Lord, here I am. Let me worship. Let me truly surrender to you. You know, Jesus came to open the way for us to be able to worship in spirit and truth. If Jesus had not died on the cross... We could not worship in spirit and in truth. Because any truth that we have would be what? Man-made. If you're depending on hearing the truth from Jim Loft, you're going to be very disappointed. But if you're coming and you're opening up your hearts to hear what the Holy Spirit is telling you, you will get a message that will be the greatest message that's ever preached in every part of the planet. Because you're receiving it from the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says when he went to heaven, he is sitting on the right-hand side of the Father. And in the old days in the Jewish, when the priest or the people sat down is when they taught. It's not like we're doing today. It used to be where I would sit down and I would take my seat and everybody else would be standing, listening to the person that's teaching. When Jesus says, I've been to heaven, I'm seated in the right-hand side of the Father. He's saying, I am in a position to teach you. Are you opening up to him so that he can teach you? You know, one of the first lessons in our walk must be to understand that to pray in the Spirit, we must do it honestly and in truth. And if we want the success of that prayer, we must do it according to his word. The woman at the well, the woman didn't even want to give him water. But yet, he sat there and he gave her the first lesson on how to connect with God. And he gave, she says, he basically, if you read it very carefully, there's three types of worshipers. So I don't want you to judge somebody else. I want you to judge yourself. Which kind of worshiper are you today? The first one is an ignorant worshiper. Anybody know what the word ignorant means? Without knowledge. Without understanding. Now, let's go to, let's back up to verse 22. I'm going, to, I'm going to read it in the King James, New King James, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit different story. It says, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is for the Jews. What did Jesus just say to her? But now, in the, in the, King, in the original writings and even in the Greek, it's a plural statement where this one makes it a singular statement. It says, you worship. It's actually ye worship. Or in North Carolina, it would be very well understood, you all, y'all. But what's interesting here, he goes into a plurality of a word speaking to a single woman. Why? Because you see what he's telling them It's for her, but it's also for everybody else that reads and hears this. So it is not just because she was there. 
It was she, he was telling her that ye, all of you, everybody here, need to understand. And he says, ye worship what you, ye not, know not. Which means you're praying and worshiping something that you don't even know. And there's many people doing that today. We have children praying that don't really know what they're praying about or who they're praying to. We have adults that do the same thing. We have people come in here and worship and have no idea of what they're worshiping and why they're worshiping. You are a Samaritan worshiper. You are the first kind of people that Jesus was addressing. The second kind is the intellectual Christian or the intelligent worshiper. And these were the Jews having the true knowledge of God, having all of the scriptures, being in the temple, being around the tabernacle of God, being around the covenant of God, they understood it. They had the knowledge of God. Then he says, we. This is important because he didn't say the Jews. He says we. And he's talking about the Jews. So Jesus was a what? A Jew. So if you don't like Jews, you're going to have a problem in heaven with Jesus. We worship that which we know. And he goes, for the salvation is to the Jews. You see, they knew what they had to do, but they were doing it to who? For their people. It's like me saying, we here are praying, and only those in First Christian Church are saved. How many of you believe that only those that are sitting in this building are saved? You believe that? No. There's probably people in this building that aren't saved. There's probably people in this building that are lukewarm. There's others that are probably so on fire that they can't sit still. So let's read this very carefully. In verse 23 and 24. But the hour is coming. He's talking about us today. And he's talking about the time that he's there. It is when true worshipers will worship the Father. You see, coming to church doesn't qualify you to be a true worshiper. If you come into church because you come to judge the music or come to judge the speaker or come to judge the sermon, you are coming in a secular form. You should be coming filled with the Holy Spirit, seeking the Holy Spirit, worshiping God by raising your voice, even if it's nothing. Do you think they had all these instruments when they were out there in the desert? We don't need all of this stuff to worship God. All of this stuff should help us, take us to where we're worshiping God. It should not be a need. That's why you need to go to Bible study. If this is the only time you're fed, that's why so many things in your life is not going out so good. I want you to do an experiment. Starting today, after the service, and I'll finish early enough for you to find your restaurant to get to. I want you to eat lunch. Eat a good, hefty lunch. You know, hamburgers stacked with five or six patties. And then not eat again until next Sunday. How will you do that week? So why do so many Christians do just that only on Sunday morning? They only get fed by the word of God on Sunday morning for 35, 45 minutes and then complain that it's too long. We worship. We need to look at this very carefully of how we're doing our walk. 
from the connection, it's evidence from the words that we must do it in spirit and in truth. I'm going to tell you something that's going to shock some of you maybe. This does not mean from the heart or sincerity. Worshiping in truth don't necessarily mean that it's from the heart only. In, you know, I'm very heartful. I'm very sincere about it. The devil is sincere about what he does. Devil worshipers worship from their heart. See, God doesn't want us to worship from our heart or from our place. God wants us to worship from the Holy Spirit that's dwelling in us, our transformed body that's been filled by the Holy Spirit, that we allow the Holy Spirit then to breathe through us and so that people can see Christ in us and not see us anymore. That is the true worship. Not just sincerely. A murderer. He can be sincerely sorry for committing a murder. Does that solve anything? No. You see, God wants us to come, and he says we, we grow by what? Renewing of the mind. How do I get on my mind renewed? How do you learn how to read and write? How do you, by the mind. How do I renew my mind? By reading pornographic materials. By watching uh, dirty movies. I renew my mind by reading and hearing of the word of God. That's why so many churches are so weak today. And I'm not talking about numbers, I'm talking about strength and power. Because we are starving for the word of God because we only go to church on Sunday morning. We don't go to Bible studies. We don't go do anything else. And we wonder why our faith is so weak. If you had the faith of si what? the size of a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. We can't move a car in the snow or in the rain. We can't even make our pews comfortable so that we can relax. Well, the pastor, blah, 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 blah. How are we going to worship God in truth? How are we going to do it honestly, seeking God? You see, the Jews had the full revelations of his word. When Jesus was speaking... And he, and anytime, by the way, anytime you read in the New Testament that they read from Scripture, what were they reading from? The Old Testament. And this is to my buddy that's online. I don't know where he lives. He always comments on me that the Old Testament is no longer valid for Christians today. What Scriptures did the disciples or did Timothy or did Jesus say, it is written. He was reading out of the King James Version that Moses carried across the Red Sea. We know that, right? No. He was reading out of the Old Testament. It is Scripture. Now, did Timothy, Timothy, he says, he had the scriptures, the word of God. He had, the book of, he had a copy of the book of Isaiah. Did he have the original writings? Did Timothy, a half Greek, he was, his mother was Jew, his father was Greek. Do you think this young kid had the original writings that Isaiah wrote that was put in the temple and Paul gave him the original writings for him to take up north? He had a copy. But yet, he says he had the scriptures. I heard the other day a pastor saying, well, people that preach that this is the word of God is mistaken because this is a copy of the word of God. We don't have the word of God. Then Paul had no idea what he was talking about. Now, some of you may have the perverted word of God 
There's a difference between making a mistake and changing the word of God on purpose. There's a big difference. The NIV, that committee decided to change the word of God so that it would not be offensive and made it a gender-free Bible. See, that's an abomination. And if any of you have one of those, you have an abomination in your house. Because they deliberately decided that Father God is offensive. So they no longer pray, our Father who art in heaven is our God who lives in heaven. Because saying he's a father, it, well, it may make women upset. Because women have the same right to be called God. Like it or don't like it, he's our father. There was among them godly men who called upon God with all their heart. There was Pharisees that prayed with all their heart, sincerely seeking God. But yet, they were not doing it in spirit and in truth. So let's look at the full meaning of what this means. Jesus saying the hour is coming, and now it is, and that only through him that worshiping God will bring the spirit and the truth. Jesus came to die on the cross. That's true. But he came so that we can become children of God and that we can go and approach God in truth and in spirit. You cannot pray to God in the spirit if you do not have the Holy Spirit. It cannot be done. So how do I get the Holy Spirit? Anybody know? You got to go to seminary for three years. You got to get a doctorate degree. No. All right. This is a big theological question. This is going to save you thousands of dollars of college. So you can write a check to Jim Loft to make up for it. How do you get the Holy Spirit? Well, that's the beginning. The Bible says very clearly, ask. Ask. Lord, I believe in you. I've come to you. Lord, I want to sur- I surrender my sins to you. I believe that Jesus died for me. Lord, I've even been baptized. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me that I may walk in the power of a living God. That I may come boldly to you in truth and in spirit. You can go boldly to God, but if you're not there in the spirit, matter of fact, to tell you something, you cannot accept Jesus Christ until the Holy Spirit calls you. So I'm going to stop right now. If anybody hearing my voice, I ask you a question. If you died right now and you went to heaven, or you went somewhere, how many of you know for sure that if you died right now that you're going to go to heaven? Every one of you should know that. It's not, it's it's, it's not a crap game where you just, you spin the, the bottles, hopefully it lands on you. You can know that you're saved. All you have to do is surrender. Say, Jesus, Lord, come into my life. Change my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may walk in the Spirit. I may walk in the truth. Lord, I can't do it. And guys, ladies, men, boys, girls, it's not that difficult. It's not a feeling. Everybody's waiting for the goosebump issues. It's a decision. Make the decision. I don't understand everything. I don't know everything. Lord, I don't know what you even look like. 
but I know my life ain't working out too good right now. I know I've got these problems, and I don't know how to fix them. So, Lord, here I am. I'm broken. I'm in desperation. I need a Savior. And I need that Holy Spirit. I need the blood of Jesus. Those, those out there, it says, they pray. They pray earnestly, yet they receive very little or receive nothing. There's others out there who pray the correct knowledge. They pray the right words. They pray the right things. They're earnest. They're hard yet. There's no blessings in their life. Those two kinds of people is one we need to get out of. We may have been like the Samaritans. We may have been like the Jews. We may have grown up in the church and gotten all the knowledge. That's the Jews. But until you find that place where you need to be broken and be built up and be touched by God, it doesn't matter what situation you're in. It doesn't matter where you are in your life. It doesn't matter. You don't get fixed first. You know, my car broke down. And I need to take it to a mechanic. My wife goes, well, no. You can't take it to the mechanic. Why not? You got to fix it first before you take it to the mechanic. Does that make sense? You see, you're broken. I'm broken. And I don't need to fix myself first. I just need to go broken to the mechanic. And the mechanic will look at me and says, Jim, what you need is a new heart. And I got one perfectly right here for you. There it is. There it is. All you got to do is take it. See, you got to think. I told a person in here once before. He, I didn't tell him. I was telling the congregation, but he got offended by it. How do, you get, how do you make money? You go to the south of the border, come in illegally. How do you make, honestly? You work. And I told him, he said, you got to get off the couch and go to work. Well, I've been praying for it. See, you're praying out of ignorance. I had a man in Maryland come to me. I finally got him a good job. Matter of fact, he was going to come to Indianapolis for the training. And he sat there, he says, Pastor, I really appreciate what you did for me, but honestly, my body's not made for work. Can you pay my light bill? Can you pay my light, a gas bill? You see... Those are the first two classes of Christians. We need to be the third class. We need to be taught how to worship him in truth. We need to alone, just by itself, get that spiritual worship in our hearts, in our lives. And I will guarantee you that if you get touched by the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter if you've got a guy, you get a monkey up here, okay? I'm telling honestly, Anybody can preach. We had, a, we had a couple in Fable that had their dog trained. And we went to the house. He goes, I'm going to show you what's going on. He started talking. The dog was barking. And he said, there, he goes, oh, the dog's barking at him. So he gets down on his knees and starts praying. And the dog puts his feet up there and acts like he's praying. Right? So he says, okay, we prayed now. And he starts talking. And then he sat there and he has a little bag. I forgot the dog's name, but he, he gives the dog, he says, all right, take the gospel around the world. The dog will take off and run around the house and come back. <laughs> now, that's, that's a trained dog. You can train a dog to do that. But what you can't do is train that dog to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. You have to do that yourself. 
In prayer, everything will depend on our understanding of his word and how we worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in in truth. We have a God that wants to be worshipped. We've got a God that wants to be worshipped so much that he knew that his creation could not worship him until he sent his son to die on an old rugged cross. Until his son had to bleed on a cross. His son, the creator of the universe, in John 1.1, in the beginning was the word and the word was God. The word was with God. The word came to earth. And man took the word and nailed it to a cross. But the man that nailed it to the cross didn't understand that he was doing the will of the Father. And when the word came off that cross, went to that grave, and the word conquered death, and the word came out and took the captives free and the word came up and went to heaven and the word is still teaching us today. Worship in truth. Come seeking him. God will reveal himself to you. There's a new inner self. He gives you a new ear, a new hearing. And you will learn that it doesn't matter where you are, you can worship Him. You can do it at work. You can do it driving. I guarantee you, try this, because I have done it. Start worshiping God in heart. Give everything to God while you're driving. I guarantee you somebody will fall over, somebody will block your way, somebody will cut you off. The devil will do everything it can to get you out of that worship. I told you when I was in Panama, Tina was was in the States. A friend of mine says, let's go to the beach. And I didn't want to go to the beach because at the beach, you see all these pretty women in bikinis. And I'm not going to go. I don't want to do this. And he goes, man, come on, man. You need to go. I got in my car, started, we started going to the beach, and I kept praying. All of a sudden, a Jeep with the, all the top, everything was off, and these, all these girls yelling at us in bikinis and saying, hey, come with us. And I'm sitting there, Lord, come on. And then one of the girls takes her top off. Lord, come on. And then it dawned on me what a pastor taught me years earlier. Pray your way out of this. At first I was going, in the name of Jesus, by the blood that was shed on Calvary. I claim victory over my mind right now. (laughs) Then the pastor's words echoed in in my mind. Don't go on the defense. See, too many Christians are living in the defense. We are not to be defensive. We're supposed to be on the attack. We are the head, not the tail. We are the conquerors. We go on the attack. And I immediately started praying, Lord, touch that building right now. Touch everybody that's living in that house. Holy Spirit, fill them. Lord, touch that church right there, Lord, that that Sunday that church will be filled. Next thing I know, that car was gone. Got to the beach. And one of the guys laughing. I go, what are you laughing about? He says, it's a topless beach. I started praying. Lord, touch that person, that family, right now in the name of Jesus. I went on the attack. A few minutes later, the police came and ran off all the naked people. And I looked at a friend of mine that was laughing at me. I says, laugh. I got the victory. See, I'm not going to play defense. Jesus didn't come to play defense. He came to offend. God is spirit. We must worship in spirit. So what does all this mean? So the woman asked Jesus, 
Where's the true place of worship? Is it on these hills the Samaritans built? Or is it in Jerusalem? See, she didn't understand. She wanted to know, hey, where do I go to worship? She didn't understand that he doesn't want you worshiping at a place. He wants you to worship in the spirit. What he's telling, he says, the true place of worship is in you. Wherever you are. However situation you're in. So, you see, he clarified. It's no longer limited to a certain place. It's no more limited to a certain location. God is spirit. is not bound by space and time. But his infinite perfection is always everywhere at the same time. If you're cutting wood, if you're building a building, if you're singing a praise, you're preaching a sermon, do it in worship. Do it with all of your heart. I was told one day, where do you pray? Do you preach differently? You're going to notice when we go to Africa, if it's five people, if it's a hundred, or if it's five hundred, I'm preaching the same way because I hopefully I pray that I preach in the spirit. God has somebody that needs to hear something. We're no longer confined to a place. But remember, God is spirit. So the deep importance and a lesson today, how much our Christianity suffers when we try to contain it into a certain place. You know, I told how many times have you said, and I've said it, so I'm, not, I'm guilty as much as anybody else. You know, somebody starts saying something not nice at church, what do you usually say? Hey, remember where you are. Okay? And I remember somebody, I said something, says, Pastor, remember where you are. Oh, so it's okay for me to do it outside of this building. Well, no. See, it doesn't matter where I'm at. I got to be a Christian 24-7. I cannot be a cafeteria Christian. I cannot choose and decide. Jesus is saying it's not a place. It is in your heart. It can be in your home. Because God is spirit. He is the everlasting, unchanging one. What he is, he will always be in truth. Our worship must then be in truth and in, and in spirit. God is spirit. So if, if God is spirit, he alone has the spirit to give. Listen to that. God is spirit. And if it's true, if he is spirit... He is the only one that can give you the spirit. You can't get it from the pastor. You can't get it from worship. You've got to get it from the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit uses worship. The Holy Spirit uses a pastor. The Holy Spirit may use a friend. But you've got to realize where it comes from. He baptizes you. What did the Bible say? So we baptize in water. John said it. What did he say? You be baptized in fire, the Holy Spirit. You see, I baptize Sunday morning. We're going to have a baptism here. I'm baptizing in water, as John the Baptist did. The Bible says that he was a great man. What an honor that is. But you see... You're being baptized in water by man, but you need to expect a baptism by fire of the Holy Spirit and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come out. I remember the strangest thing I had in baptism in here. It was in this church, and I didn't know how to act. I baptized a man. He came up. I'm getting ready to pray for him. He gives me a big hug. It gives me a big old kiss on the cheek. And I'm going, okay. But you see, he was excited. He didn't care what people thought. He was excited. In John 1, 33, 7, 37, 16, 7, the Spirit could not stream forth until Jesus was glorified. 
Jesus rose from the grave, taught for 40 days, told 500 people, go into Jerusalem and wait, for the helper is coming. You see, Jesus had to get to heaven. He had to be in heaven. He had to take his blood. He had to show up. He had to be glorified before the Holy Spirit could come. Ten days later, talk about Christians, 500. Could you imagine if you're the 500? Think about it. You met Jesus on the road in Galilee, or you met him at the, at the, at the lake, or you met him walking through Bethlehem, or walking through Nazareth, or walking through Jerusalem. You saw him. Then you saw him crucified. Well, you, maybe you were there on the mountain when he fed you, the 5,000 and the 4,000. Maybe you're one of those guys that go, man, this is the Messiah. You watch him die on the cross. You go, oh, man, maybe I was wrong. Three days later, you're walking on the road, and you see this Jesus walking to you, next to you. 500 people witnessed his resurrection. 500 people were there when Jesus went into heaven. Standing there going, man, I saw Jesus on this planet. I saw him dying on the cross. I saw him resurrected. Now I see him literally going into heaven in the clouds. How much faith would you have? Wouldn't that be cool? Honestly. And then the angel says, what are you waiting for? Did not he tell you to go to Jerusalem and, not, and wait? Well, wait for him to come back. This is a key, key thing for end times, by the way. I don't care what Tim LaHaye says, all right? I don't care what David Jeremiah says. The angel says, Jesus will return as he left. In the cloud. Okay? Take your theology however you'd like it. In the Bible it says, an angel spoke to them and said, he will return as he left. So how's Christ coming back? In a cloud. Just side note. That don't count against my time. See? We need to get him into the innermost sanctuary. We are the temple of God. And the innermost sanctuary is in us. His blood had therefore cover us and cleanse our sanctuary so that the Holy Spirit could dwell. It was Christ who redeemed us. And we in him had received the position as children. And the Father sent forth his spirit of his son into our hearts and cry as Jesus cried. We read this in Romans 8, 15, Abba, Abba, Father. Or in modern vernacular, Daddy. The worship is in spirit. This is the reason we pray in the name of Jesus. We never find one of the Old Testament saints appropriating himself as a child of God. Do you notice that? You ever notice that? He never calls Jehovah God Father until Jesus died on the cross and he came and he sits on the right hand side of the Father. We must worship in spirit and truth. We must worship in truth in all that he has done. What is truth? What is truth? If you're praying and you're worshiping in truth, it must align with Scripture. Don't take my word. Don't take any preacher's or pastor's or anybody's word. Read the word of God. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the truth and the life. No one comes unto the Father except by me. 
The Old Testament is the shadow of the promise. The New Testament is the promise fulfilled. Jesus is full of grace and truth. The Holy Spirit has the spirit of truth. Do you have Jesus in your heart today? Are you worship Him in spirit and in truth? How do I do that? It's very simple. I surrender to Him. So let us begin today, not with a carnal mind, but with a spirit mind. Jesus, give us the spirit. Holy Spirit, transform my life. There's many Christians that are praying and their prayers aren't answered. Are you praying the right words? Are you repeating the Lord's prayer like we, we, we did here, we do here most of the time? I keep telling people, that is not the Lord's prayer. That is a model to a prayer that Jesus taught and said, these are the six petitions that you bring before the Father. Are we praying in repetition? Or are we truly surrendering to Him? Is there anything wrong with repeating what we call the Lord's, Lord's Prayer? No, nothing wrong with that. But are you doing it out of heart? Or are you doing it because of just repetition? You see, I can't judge that. That's only between you and God. And you know how you feel. You know when you're in the Spirit. You know when it's time. Let's bow our heads. Before I do that, is there anybody in here that feels that they need to be prayed for? Anybody in here? Maybe you're not walking the way you should walk. The altar is open. Come on up. Don't be afraid. The Holy Spirit telling you to come. Come. Don't let embarrassment or pride stop you. Be part of what God has called you to do. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, I love you. I love what you taught that woman. Lord, I love what you taught that woman. She even refused to give you water. I love to learn what worship is and what you want, Lord. I rejoice in the assurance that you paid for my sins, that I was not worthy, I was broken, and you made me whole. Lord, I know when I misstep that you're always there, and you're wanting me to come to you. You wanted me to put aside my pride, my arrogance, and just submit to you. Teach me then, Lord. Teach me how to pray, how to worship in spirit and in truth. Lord, open up my mind and my heart that I may receive and learn. Lord, if I'm doing it wrong, correct me. Lord, if I missed the mark, fix it. Lord, if I'm broken, fix it. I'm coming to you, Lord. Touch us. Touch this church as a whole, Lord. Touch us in a mighty way. Teach us to draw close to you, Lord. Teach us how to worship and that we can raise up and we can shake the gates of hell, Lord, that the demons in this place will go running. The demons in our town will go running. The demons of addiction will be broken. The demon of lying and cheating will be broken. Lord, make us whole. Lord, do bless us. I know, Lord, I am your child. And as a child, I rebel. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Let your heart replace mine. Let your thoughts replace mine. And let you and you only, whatever words come out of my mouth, let it come from the spirit of the living God and let it be true in what I speak. Give me wisdom to know when I've misspoken. Give me understanding to know when I don't know. But right now, I surrender to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.